Thank you, Laura. I hope your hearts have been prepared today. The music is not just something to fill time. The music is to prepare our hearts for all of us to sing together and lift our praises to the Lord. And I feel that has been done today. Laura's faithfulness over these many decades. Consistent, godly music. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come to you today to hear from your word that you would open our hearts. There might be some folks here today that are hurting. There's struggles going on in their life. I ask you to be with them, comfort them. I ask you to be with those that are guests with us today, that they would feel uh, the Holy Spirit speak to them. I ask you to be with all of us, dear Heavenly Father, that we would be open to your word. And as we've sung your praises, that we will also live the life that would be a blessing to you and obedience to you. Be with us now and in Jesus' name, amen. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 20. It's Labor Day weekend. And thank you for being here, by the way, on Labor Day weekend. Uh, you just Memorial Day and Labor Day, you just never know who's going to be here. And I appreciate you being here uh, in force today. Uh, I don't know if that says our economy that we can't get out or, or if that just means it's been a good weekend for you to be here. But I appreciate uh, that, that you are here with us today. So let's talk about labor. Let's talk about our business, our fellow man. Uh, today's, the entitled for today's message is, It's Your Business. It's Your Business. From the very first conflict in the pages of the Bible, Cain asked God, am I my brother's keeper? Am I supposed to watch out for those around me? Are, are they my concern? And the answer came back, what? Yes. Yes, you are. It's your business. It's my business. In King Solomon's design to show us how to not mess up our lives, he has a lot to say about our business. And we'll see as we go through these today that it boils down to our relation and our care for those around us. Our neighbors, our customers, our associates, even our family. So let's see what Solomon has to say today about how we treat others and how we talk with others. Just two points. How we treat others and how we talk with others. So we'll first look at how we treat others. Now, if I was to go across the crowd here today, uh, we could probably break ourselves into two different crowds of this, two different groups. Those that love to negotiate, I'm looking at Brother Rick here, and those who despise it, that's me. There's a group here that when it's time to get a new car, new, used, whatever it is, a new car for you, you are doing this, you are licking your chops, and it becomes a personal challenge to you to, to get the lowest price you can possibly get. You're the person that loves to go to garage sales, and you don't give them the, the dollar for the little trinket. You try to get it down to 50 cents. You're the person that loves to go to flea markets, or if you've ever had an opportunity to go on like a cruise to the, a, a straw market, those, those are the deals. You love to haggle. All those, types of, all those types of people. And those of you that are smiling, you're that person, all right? Then there's the other group. I'm the other group. Give me your best price or don't. I'll go somewhere else. I don't really care. I, I'm, I, I, will, I will go and will not negotiate with you if you're going to try that game with me. I don't like to ha haggle. I've always feel like when I have to haggle, when I go in to get a car, I always, doesn't matter who it is, I always feel like I'm being cheated at the end. That's just how I feel. I don't like that, all right? Solomon speaks to us in Proverbs 20, verse 14. He says, it is not, it is not, saith the buyer, but when he is gone his way, then he boasts. Look at the interior of that car. It's a little dingy. I'm probably going to have to clean that. 
Uh, I think this car needs some new brakes on it for sure. And, oh, look at these tires. They, they've only got maybe a, a, you know, half a year left on them. Uh, or this car, this house that I'm going to go buy, that's probably going to need a new roof. Uh, did you see there's some chips in that tile? I'm probably going to have to replace this. And this, this kitchen, it's way outdated. I'm going to have to update this kitchen. And on and on and it goes, you're going to have to lower the price, Right? You're going to have to lower the price. Then, after the purchase is made, they go home to their friends and they say, you will never guess how cheap I got that car or how low I got the price on that house. It is not. It is not, saith the buyer. But when he has gone his way, then he boasts. Now, it's who we are. It's always been this way. It's the way we, it's part of the negotiation. And Solomon isn't saying here that it's right or wrong. It's just how we live, right? This is society today. But then he begins to show us that there are ways to treat people and not to treat others. In fact, if you're part of the folks that have been reading through the Bible together with us this year, uh, we've been in the major prophets for several weeks. Several weeks. We're going to get through them, I promise. But we've seen in those major prophets over and over and over again, one of the reasons of God's judgment that comes upon Israel is because of the way they were treating each other, specifically in business. Specifically, they were treating the poor, the widowed, the orphaned, the the needy, and they were taking advantage of them. And over and over, the word is they were oppressing them. God will not have us to act that way. So Solomon starts to bring out different subjects here that we need to look at. And the first one is honesty versus dishonesty. And you say, well, that sounds almost adolescent to talk about that. We know we're supposed to be honest. Okay. But each of us has a prism in which we look through to see those around us, our fellow man. We see each person as someone, maybe not each person, but that person that's outside our immediate circle. We see through that prism as someone to either take advantage of so I can get as much as I can get for myself or a person that deserves to be treated with dignity and honesty. That's how we see. One of those two is how we see folks. Proverbs tells us in 11.1, a false balance is abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. We'll come back and explain what this means. Divers, 2010, divers weights are different weights, and divers measures, both of them are alike, abomination to the Lord. 23, verse 23, divers weights are an abomination unto the Lord. I think he thinks it's an abomination. A false balance is not good. We have the visual here of someone that is weighing out something. Either they're weighing out uh, some grain or back in this day they were grain or figs or something of that. And the shop owner in his bag, so you imagine this scale, and on one side you would put your weight, that is, we'll use our measures, a pound, and on this side you're putting the product. And he has one weight that he is labeled a pound when he's buying And he has another weight that is a pound when he is selling. And each of those work to his advantage when he has a false balance or diver's weight. It reminds me of this old picture of Norman Rockwell. Uh, If you see there, this lady's buying a chicken for the day. She has her finger on the scale to make it lighter. He has his finger on the scale to push it lower, right? Now, that's a funny picture. Or this guy that's at the airport, and if you notice his foot underneath the bag, trying to make his bag a little lighter so he doesn't have to pay the extra fee, I know they're crazy, it's absolutely ridiculous, the fees that they they charge us here. So we see here, as these people are doing this thing, it's dishonest. And actually, those are funny pictures, but it's theft. It's theft on the part of the business owner who's trying to rip them off. And it's theft on the side of the customer who's trying to do the opposite. God calls it an abomination. That's his strongest word for sin. Now, we should not just limit this to our financial transactions. In 1715, he says, He that justifieth the wicked and he that condemneth the just, 
Even they both are abomination to the Lord. Those that are saying the wicked are good and the good are wicked. When we venture outside of Proverbs for a moment, Isaiah puts it very succinctly. He says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. This speaks of intentionally being dishonest for our gain, for the gain of our cause, for the gain of our financial aspect, for the, dare I say at this time of year, for the gain of our candidate. Would we do this? And all of this comes down to how do we see those around us? Do we see the folks around us as an image bearer of our Heavenly Father to be treated pop properly, or as P.T. Barnum said, there's a sucker born every minute. Which way do we see those around us? God sees it this way. In Proverbs 16, 11, he says, A just weight and balance are the Lord's. It's always the same. All the weights of the bag are his work. With God, there is honesty, integrity, consistency toward all people. He said, Keith, it's just business. How else are we going to get ahead? It's just business. Brother Rick was telling me a situation this week. We were driving, and I forget where we were driving. We were, uh, we were going somewhere, and he, uh, he had asked for the price uh, for an item uh, to, be, uh, to be installed. And he was given the price, and when he saw it, he was like, that is, seems really high. Now, he's a, he's a haggler, but this wasn't a haggle situation. And it seemed really, really high. And uh, he goes to another vendor, and sure enough, it was $600 higher. The guy came, the other person was $600 cheaper for the same item from, for the same work. Now, to put that in perspective, it was almost 50% of the price. After having the work done by the, the cheaper contractor, the first vendor, he goes back to the first vendor to have something else done, and they said, well, I wish you would have told me, and we would have given you a better price. Yeah, that's how he felt too, <laughs> all right? And he said, there's the problem. You have in that, you, that tells me that you have been intentionally gouging me. Now, we sit here and we think, well, that's just capitalism, isn't it? The, the market will just figure that out. And that is true. That is just capitalism to a certain extent. But that is diverse weights is what that is. That's diverse weights. That's what boil, this boils down to. There is nothing, nothing wrong with making an honest profit. That's how we stay in business, without a doubt. But we know when we've crossed the line. The Holy Spirit speaks to you. You know when you've crossed the line between honesty and dishonesty. It's your business. Second, we see kindness versus provoking. Kindness versus provoking. I currently have a situation near my street uh, where two neighbors, this is the stupidest thing, two neighbors are feuding over a strip of grass that is not as wide as my desk, all right? It's like a two to three foot wide uh, little strip of grass. In fact, there are signs, multiple signs over it saying, no trespassing, uh, stay off grass. Now, both are very kind people when you speak to them. However, this promised land of two to three feet of grass there, it has become a war. It is just ridiculous to watch. Life is too short. Life is but a vapor, and that is not what this vapor is going to be spent on. We have choices to make. Will we provoke, stir the pot? Will we provoke those around us, or will we show kindness? Will we be a peacemaker in our life? Solomon gives us some straightforward instruction. He says in 329, Devise not evil against thy neighbor, seeing he dwells securely, securely by thee. 1112, He that is void of wisdom despiseth his neighbor. You're void of wisdom when you do these things. But a man of understanding holdeth his peace. 1421, He that despiseth his neighbor sinneth, but he that hath mercy on the poor, happy is he. 
Now, this doesn't always just mean the neighbor right next door, all right? This is our fellow man. 1629, a violent man enticeth his neighbor and leadeth in him into the way that is not good. 25, 8, go, for, go not forth hastily to strive, lest thou know not what to do in the end thereof, when thy neighbor hath put thee to shame. How do we deal with our neighbor? How do we deal with our work associate, that guy in the cubicle, or that guy who uh, is in the other car that you're dealing with, the, the teammate, the PTA member, the customer, the supplier? How do we deal with them? Will we allow ourselves to be controlled by our impulses, by our annoyances, by our anger, pettiness, and desires? Many times we do fall prey to that, do we not? And each and every one of us have allowed that to happen in our life. Or will we, be, will we follow God's direction of showing kindness and self-control toward those? Because he tells us there in 1629 that our actions lead the other person in a way that is not good. We are become the cause of their sin, he tells us there. 25.8, he tells us that we cause ourselves shame. We put dishonor on our name when we do these things. And we have to ask ourselves when this comes about, who are we? As a Christian, who are you? You are a child of God. You are an ambassador of Jesus Christ to the world around you. And when we are violent, when we, uh, when we despise people, when we entice people to sinfulness, when we are devising evil against another person, how in the world is that representing Jesus Christ? It's not at all. But they started it, Keith. Yeah, that's what my, that's what my three-year-old granddaughter says. You don't know what they have done to me. And you're right, I don't. Uh, I can't take it anymore. I have to win this. Great. You won. You won the argument. You won the fight. You won the situation. What have you gained? A two to three foot piece of grass? Really? Right? Right? You've destroyed your witness. You've destroyed a testimony with that person and anyone else. And there are other people that are privy to that argument. Paul puts it this way. Romans 12, and starting in verse 17, he says, Recompense no man evil for evil. Don't give them what they deserve. Don't give them what you just got. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. Underline this verse. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, do what? Live peaceably with all men. And that's tough. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. We're putting it in God's hand. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, Give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head. <laughs> Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. That's not just church talk. That's the word of God. That's actually instruction from the Lord. Let God handle the avenging that you feel needs to be done in life. Instead, be like Christ and feed your enemy. Give them drink, help them in time of need, and overcome evil with good. I'm not telling us to be a doormat. That's not what this is saying. Our Lord Jesus Christ was the strongest man that ever lived. Yet in his meekness, with his strength under control, he was not a doormat. He, he said what needed to be said, but he was gracious, loving, and meek to those around him. Let God handle the avenging. Be a witness and trust God's justice will prevail. Jesus Christ's example of meekness is what we are to emulate in our life. We as a child of God have the strength and ability to do many things. And it should not be used to, to get aven avenging on our, for ourselves, but it should be used with discretion. It should be used to see other people 
uh, be loved and to draw them closer to the Lord. We all have competitors. We all have someone in business that's a competitor, somebody at school that's a competition to you, someone that's on a team, and on and on and on it goes. We all have neighbors who we disagree with on topics. I have neighbors that have started to put signs in their yard for candidates that I completely despise. All right? How am I going to treat that person? Is every, if I treat them poorly and in just in about four months, is everything going to be okay after I treated them that way? I would say not. We do have memories. And we do have differences of opinion. What witness are you showing them? Are you intentionally, are we intentionally provoking them to anger or are we intentionally showing God's patience, God's kindness and honesty? When you do, I promise you, you stick out. Because they're not going to return that many times and you will stick out. And that leads to opportunities to be a witness. It's your business. So we see how we are to treat others let us see also how we are to talk with others. Will we be a uniter or a divider? Proverbs 11.9, a hypocrite with his mouth destroyeth his neighbor, but through knowledge shall the just be delivered. 24.28, be not a witness against thy neighbor without cause. Deceive not with thy lips. Debate thy cause with thy neighbor himself. Go to him directly and discover not a secret to another. See, the honesty and kindness and the dishonesty and provoking, they lead us to this final point of are you a person that unites or a person that divides? And when he talks these in these two verses that are up here, 25 9 and, and 25 18, they go hand in hand with each other. If you have a problem with someone, be it your neighbor, your coworker, a family member, a, a teammate, whatever it is, go to them. It tells us there, talk to them directly. Talk it over with them. Don't go talking behind them, telling that secret to anyone that will listen to it. And he tells us in verse 18 there, when, when you spread a lie, what's it say there? A man that beareth false witness against his neighbor is a maul, a sword, a sharp arrow. Imagine a maul, this big hunk of wood that's here, and you, you've got that, that maul that's there, and you're hitting it, and it's driving, and it is splitting the wood. Or the sword that when you slash that sword across someone, it slices someone in two, and it splits them. And that's what it's talking about here. You have the power to deceive and divide, being like a maul or like a sword, or to build up and unite. It's your business. You have the ability to do this or not. And the Lord's instruction was to, for us was to go to our fellow Christian. When we get into the Gospels, he, Jesus says, I want you to go to someone that you've offended or that has offended you. Don't go telling everybody else. He says, I want you to go quickly. I want you to go directly to them. And I want you to go privately to them. How much more then do we go to our neighbors, to those that are around us? Because as we think of this, it all boils down on all these verses of, who are you? Who is your neighbor? Are we dishonest, provoking, dividing? We see them as deserving of the treatment. That means when we see them as deserving of that treatment, that either means we see ourselves as superior or someone that is a victim that deserves justice which we've taken into our own hands and not left it with the Lord. Or when we see ourselves as honest, when we treat people uh, with honesty and kindness and uniting, we see these folks as the image bearer of God, someone that's deserving of dignity. And when we do that, we've decided to love God and to love our neighbor as ourselves heard that somewhere the greatest of the commandments God has given us a daily decision a case by case decision and until we do that long enough it eventually becomes part of our character it becomes just 
part of our very nature, just as it is the nature of our Lord. Our mission as a church is to help people meet, magnif- model, and magnify Jesus Christ. Helping people meet, model, and magnify Jesus Christ. How do we model Jesus? How are we modeling Jesus? How do we treat our neighbor? It's crucial. It's crucial if we ever expect them to hear what we say about Jesus Christ. How we treat them affects how they then hear or look at that track that we give them, that invitation to one of our services, that opportunity to actually open the word of God with them and share Jesus Christ. Now, nothing I've said here is an epiphany to us, right? Nothing here we've not heard. This is basic Christianity 101. Yet it has been lost in the churches. Examine your life. Allow the Holy Spirit to search your motives, to search your actions this week, this month. How do you see that person on the job? How do you see that person on your team? That classmate, how do you see that person that's your actual neighbor? It's your business. It truly is. If the Lord's given us conviction in our life, we need to respond. If the Lord's given us encouragement, we need to rejoice and continue down that path. It says in 1222, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. But they that deal truly are his delight. May we be the Lord's delight. If you would bow your heads. This is a message to the church, to Christians. How will we be the witness that we need to be if we're not following the, the principles in the word of God, on our honesty, how we treat others, how we speak with others. May we follow the words of Solomon. If we've been convicted, let us respond. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and as we uh, come to your word, as we've heard this, that you would help us apply this in our life. Help us to see our motives, our actions for what they are. Dear Heavenly Father, help us to be a person that brings kindness, that brings Uh, opportunities, therefore, to spread your light, to share Jesus Christ with others. Be with us now. Help us to respond to you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would stand with me at this time, our altar is open. This is a church that you would like to be part of. I encourage you to come. There's some decisions you need to make in just following the Lord and how he's spoken to you today. I encourage you to do that as well as Brother Matt sings.